Hello, folks. Welcome to God's Word Alive. Uh, for some of you that are watching live, it's tonight. If you're watching later, we're not sure what time of day it is, but we're just so glad that you're here. Uh, the table has a little different look tonight. Uh, my name is Brian. I've got Joy to my right, your left, and Tim uh, to your left. And uh, we're excited to start a new study this week. Uh, we're going to be looking through the books of Acts. And we're going to be primarily in Acts 1 tonight with a little peek into Acts 2 as well. So if you've got your Bible close at hand, uh, turn it open to Acts 1, and uh, we'll be there in just a few minutes. But Tim, a few housekeeping, perhaps details are in order first. Well, you guys know how all this works, so we want to hear from you. And tonight, if there are, there are things that are stirring your heart and you'd like to get them uh, out uh, for the panel to uh, take note of and make note of here in front of the audience, we would love to hear from you. So please be uh, responding on Facebook. You just write your comments down there and, and uh, we'll pick them up and be able to and be able to uh, discuss them while we're up here. One more thing, if you, if you uh, would like to, you can also text in without everybody else knowing about it. We'll pick it up. That's gonna be to 479-220-7107. That's 220-7107. And you can text in comments on tonight's uh, program or even text in uh, some prayer requests because we're going to be watching and picking those up. And even if you respond after uh, our program's over, uh, we're still going to be watching. We're going to be picking up those prayer requests and making sure we take them to God uh, on your behalf. So we thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, we're praying for a, a wonderful time together. So, Joy, why don't you uh, kick us off with prayer please sure let's bow our heads heavenly father thank you for a house of prayer a prayer where we had the opportunity to come together where you said where one or two are gathered you are in the midst so father we thank you so much for sending your holy spirit to be with us this evening may we set down the cares of this world and anything that might be um causing can it, causing us to be unfocused allow us to set that down so that we might be focused on your word this evening that we might hear from you father we pray for your holy spirit to be um speaking through us and to dwell in us in jesus name amen, amen. many of you know a uh, little different background here and we're actually shooting uh from our church and we have an audience tonight we had an audience last week as well and so for you uh, in our audience that are actually in person, if you're so bold as to want to make a comment, you can either raise your hand. You could uh, jump on your phone and, and text it in in comments or whatever you want to do. So it's kind of a hybrid thing we're doing. We're trying to allow people to enjoy this study live with us as well as you folks on Facebook. It's like a live studio audience. Live studio audience, yes. <laughs> uh, it, it works good for... Letterman, I'm not sure about us, but we're going to give it a shot. <laughs> the book of Acts is an amazing book because it's really the story of the early Christian church. And uh, I don't know, Tim or Joy, if you want to kind of give us a context that we land on Acts 1-1, what has just happened? What's the context that we come into the book of Acts with? Um, What's, what's the storyline that brings us to this brand new book? Well, the crucifixion is incredibly recent history. So it's fresh on everybody's minds. And all of these folks are looking for, well, what's next? Our Messiah, what happened? Uh, we, we've got to understand all these things. Yeah. Were, were they competent? Were they afraid? Uh, what, what, was their, what was their mood, do you think? Well, when you first look at it, it's 120 people gathered together. So it wasn't a small amount of people. That's, you know, fairly large for a, a gathering of this kind. And they were all kind of coming together. At first, it was business, right? So here they had lost one of their disciples. They had lost Christ. And now it was, okay, we know we, we should, we think we should have one more. The first thing they did was start praying. 
where do we go from here? What, what are our next steps? And then they, as 120, they all bowed and prayed and said, what should we do next? And that next thing was to, uh, to find who Christ or God was going to assign to be the 12th disciple. 12th disciple. And we won't cover that a whole lot tonight, but that's in verses 15, really all the way down through verse uh, 26. You see the 12th disciple, who was Judas, his position be filled. Mm -hmm. um, but so, Earl, but go ahead, Joy. Yeah, so I was just going to say, not only were they coming together as a group, um, and they were coming for very important per reason, reason, and that was really to seek out what the Lord wanted. They were also taking care of business. There were things that needed. There were things that needed to be taken care of as a community, as a church community. But besides that, it was this Christ, he's died, and he said when he died, he would send what? What did he say he was going to send? And this comforter. is the comforter, comforter. right? Was let's, the comforter. let's read. Tim, would you be willing to, willing, excuse me, to read verses, this is Acts 1, verses 4 through 8. And then we'll go back and talk about some of this. But look at 4 through 8, and it gives us an idea of what this looked like, what it felt like, and what was going on. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Tim, really quick, who is he in this case? This would be Jesus. This would be Jesus, okay. Excuse he me. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What struck me as I read this was that many of these people have spent three very concentrated years with Christ. They had seen him um, die on the cross. They had seen him resurrected. And now they were here in his presence. But had they figured out truly what Christ came to this earth to do yet? Or was there still some confusion? Well, there was definitely some confusion. That's why they were asking, okay, is this the time? Is this the time that you're going to take over? Is this when, when you're going to take full authority over the earth? And this is when Christ says, you, don't, you won't know what the time is. That's for, for me to guide. But you do have a job. You do have a responsibility. And I'm going to give you the power to do that. What do you think, and, and I'm asking you guys to perhaps fill in the blanks, because there's not a lot of detail, at least in this pas passage, given as to what really took place in that, that space before Christ returned to heaven. What do you think was going on there? Well, we do have uh, several hints from other places in Scripture. But Jesus was with them for 40 days, so there was a, there was a growth taking place from the disciples who were on the road to Emmaus. So on Resurrection Sunday, when Jesus explains everything of Scripture from him, of himself to those two disciples, now this has got to spread through the whole group. Everybody's be, got to become cemented into the belief of what Jesus was doing, that all Scripture was actually pointing to him. So for this 40-day time period, they are literally taking in from the Savior himself all of these understandings coming from the Old Testament. So they're gaining strength and knowledge. They're coming up to the point where the Holy Spirit power could actually, actually be placed on them because they're settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually. Mm -hmm. So there's, there is a huge amount of work going on in this very short time period. And I asked a question about their confusion. If you go back to verse 3, um, I'll just read verse 1 to 3. It gives a context. It said, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, 
after he, and after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. They had been confused so many times over the past three years. And just like Tim, you said, he needed 40 days for them to begin to understand what it was he came for, what the kingdom of God looked like, and then most importantly, as we look at, at the beginning of the early Christian church, what was their role in the kingdom of God? He says, he, Christ tells them, but you shall receive power from the Holy Spirit as it has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he lets them know that this is what your, your job is. It's to be a witness, right? It's to testify of who Christ is. And one of the things that we know with Christ spending 40 days with them, you know, some of the question was, was it really him in the flesh? Well, 40 days, 40 nights, we know, we know Christ broke bread with them. We know he ate, ate with, with them. them. You, you eat because you're hungry. You're hungry because you're human, right? You, because you, you, you need to sustain. So we know that Christ, when he resurrected, he came back like you and I and needing food and sustenance. And he sat with them and still taught them. So it was, it was truly a 40-day transformation um, that was taking place in there, even though in the very beginning they knew their job was going to be to witness. Well, let's not be too hard on them either uh, in the sense uh, here they may have been learning all this. They, they may be coming to a better understanding of what my role is in this, but you can't help it. You're, the first question that comes out of your mouth is, well, Lord, when are you going to set up the kingdom? I mean, this is what we're waiting on. And we're doing the same thing as disciples today. Mm. We're asking the exact same question. question. Yeah. Lord, when are you coming again? It's been a long time. We're ready. What is it that it's going to take for you to come and set up the kingdom? We're asking the same question. Mm. We are. And, and so much so of what... So do we have the same answer? Well, and it, it's I'm a, afraid we we really may, but that's <laughs> going to come out in the in the rest of the chapter. The rest of the chapter, <laughs> yeah. But I think it is very important to realize that we're looking at the early Christian church and the formation of the early Christian church. But so much of what we're going to be looking at tonight and for the next few weeks is instructive for us as God's family headed home, because we have the same commission, we have the same assignment, and we have some of the same questions. So it's interesting to me that that in the midst of this questioning about God's kingdom and in, and in the giving of the commission, this lesson that they're going through, this learning is interrupted by something quite dramatic. Um, Joy, would you be willing to read verses 9 through 11? Because Christ has spent 40 days with them, eating, teaching, mm -hmm. I would imagine <coughs> praying, answering questions, uh, wrestling with things, and being given this, this almost unbelievable commission that they had to have wondered, how in the world could we do that? How could we take the gospel to the then known world? Mm. But something amazing happens next. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards the heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go into the heaven. Okay, Tim, I'm going to ask you a question. Could you raise the idea that it was quite natural for them to say, Okay, we've gone through a crucifixion, and the resurrection and it was somewhat natural for them to say what next when is this going to happen how does christ as he leaves earth how does he address those questions with what we just read oh my and and tim had no idea that this question was coming <laughs> <laughs> because he responds to the doubt and the questions that you raised 
Mm. Well, I was actually, re while Joy was reading these scriptures, I was thinking of the danger that a little bit of depression could set in. Mm. Wait a minute, I'm asking you, Jesus, when are you setting up the kingdom? And now I'm taken to a mount and I'm watching him ascend to heaven and I'm having to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. A second time? In second a very time. dramatic way? Yes, yes. And, and this is a very short space of time. Mm -hmm. I've, I've lost him to death recently. Right. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. And, and now I'm, I'm losing him again? Boy, this was quick. And it would be so easy to fall into a depression at mm. this point. Or confusion. But, okay, exactly. No. Exactly. Mm. But I love how those angels answer it. Mm. And, and I think maybe that's where the strength is. God never leaves us with, with that can't, can't cross over feeling uh, impossible to understand feeling the angels come and say oh no 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 no, no. yes they're the great promise this jesus that you're seeing go up into heaven is coming back again mm -hmm. and they had heard him say it over and over and and that is the strength that comes into the heart that gives you the hope to to press on and, th and there's no doubt that christ knew even though they had had 40 days with him and they had had tremendous time to grow and to be strengthened they it was still 40 days 40 days from the crucifixion give or take you know they were they were still fresh fresh and trying to figure this out and and what he gave them as i look at that this same jesus will come again um he gave them hope he gave them the idea that um you're going to see me again and, and, and something for them to hang on to. I suppose that some of the disciples were far, had far greater understanding than potentially others did. Because you can tell just by reading even Peter's writings uh, and John, they talk about how we were eyewitnesses. We beheld him. We, we touched him. That's right. Uh, we saw with our own eyes and here in this 40 day time period they are getting that understanding of the messiah's role not only to be the savior and the sacrifice but they began to understand the messiah's role as finally being king they don't they didn't have the full uh the full knowledge that we've got because of the of all the new testament scriptures that now we have the benefit of but they were starting to separate the roles and to understand yeah. it. So, and, and if you stitch together their commission, their charge that's given in verses 7 and 8, which he says, I need you to go to the whole world, mm -hmm. and I need you to be witnesses about me. And then he says, and I am coming back. And, and you could see that perhaps they were beginning to to get a clear picture not completely because they still were waiting on the promise of the holy spirit mm -hmm. but they were beginning to understand how this might work even though it was confusing even though it had to have been um sad it had to have been very difficult to again say goodbye to their friend christ it, it really seems the, like there were two things they were being asked to do one was to sit and stand to wait right to just stay there and wait just to and wait for that comfort or wait for the holy spirit to come and then they would be you will be witnesses right and so what is what do those look like what does it look like to be a witness i mean when i i think that uh tim you brought up a good point when you said it was then and are we asking the same questions now and do we not have the same commission now to receive the holy spirit right and to be a witness to the ends of the earth i mean that's really what our commission is and when you see that you recognize that these were humble men these were these were not you know they were fishermen and tax collectors they were not these you know high prestigious people so 
it, there was no question that it was the Holy Spirit that gave their words power that 2,000 years later we're still holding their words. We're still looking to what they wrote for hope. And I, I look here this morning, I read Philippians um, 4, uh, 10 through uh, 13. And I read this this morning, and this was before Pastor Rick had said something about you know, um, coming this evening. And this kind of sealed the deal after I thought about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it says, the things which you learned, you received and heard and saw with me, do these and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly for now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now, not that I speak in regard to need for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and in and I know how to abound every everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both abound and to suffer need I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. these are Paul's words you know again to us today that strengthen us it, it gives us that same hope it's that same uh, he's going to be the one to give us the comfort. He's going to be the one to give us that direction. And it's so easily that, so easily um, mistaken or confused that Christ gave very specific instructions to stay here and wait for the Holy Spirit. I, I think you know, we, we ran over verse four, <coughs> Tim, when you read it. We didn't go back and look at it. But the idea of, it says, but wait for the promise of the Father. And I think sometimes we wonder, well, at my church, nothing seems to happen, or in my life, nothing seems to happen. You know, uh, Holy Spirit doesn't ever seem to pour himself out in my life. But do I ever actually stop and wait? Do I ever sit somewhere waiting for God um, to show up in my life? You know, that, that was a, that's 40 days. Admittedly, they were with Christ in those 40 days. That had to have been exciting. But they waited even beyond that. Um, and it was the waiting and the, and the growing that took place during that time and that connection with, with God that made the difference when the Holy Spirit came. So if Had you paralleled this to where we're at today, today. right? <laughs> and we would say we're in that waiting pattern, we're in that holding pattern, we're, we're in that learning pattern right now. Um, allowing the Holy Spirit to change us, allowing the relationship with Christ to change us, you know, what does that look like? How are we able to witness or to testify of how the Holy Spirit's working in our lives even today? Well, I think uh, it's, it's still identical to their situation. Yep. And, it, and it boils down to simply this. They had been with the Savior for three years. They had seen what the image of God actually looks in like in, in a flesh. human being, in, a, in the flesh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So now their greatest ambition, they're not thinking about witness like we do. We think a witness says, oh, I need to go hand out tracts this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Witness <laughs> is to allow the Holy Spirit in our hearts that the image of Christ can shine out. Their ambition was to let the world see the image of Jesus in them. That's the witness. Yes. So, the, so that brings me to my question of, you know, have you experienced those times where when you reflect back, when something happens, like maybe it's uh, actions you take or words you speak, and then you think about it and you're like, that was not me. The, the, that was not really me. Like, I would have never said that, but you recognize that it, that it was Christ in you that did that, that. You were allowing the Holy Spirit in. Right, yes. right. So I think, yes. you know, what, what my experience is that this, because it's not me, it's some, you know, it's Christ in me, that's what other people have the opportunity to see, right? And we see that in others as well. And we're like, that was not them. But that really made a lot of sense. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Well, let's lay down a couple uh, script, uh, 
pieces of scripture because we're, we're kind of getting ready to really talk about when this promise um, is fulfilled. Um, Tim, would you read 12 through 14? Because this looks now, Christ has returned to heaven. Now these 120, plus or minus a few, we're all alone. And it talks a little bit about what took place as they continued to wait. <clears throat> Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were, where, where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. What jumps <laughs> off the page at you there? I mean, obviously we have a list of individuals. We talk about them returning to Jerusalem. But if you look at verse 14, what, what was happening there that should talk to us today in 2021? And not only people who are waiting for Christ's return, but for people who want so dearly for maybe the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our churches, uh, this, the Holy Spirit to show up in our families. What was happening with those individuals after the return of Christ to heaven that, well, that allowed the next set of verses to happen? Well, I, I know where you're going, but I'm going to answer this first. It's Good. Like, the first thing that <laughs> jumps out at me is that Jesus, Mary's, uh, Mary, Jesus's mother, and his brothers were there. I mean, there's, you know, when when you accept Christ as your Savior, there's nothing more exciting than your family accepting Christ as well. So the fact that they were Great. all there together, um, and it does say that it says in one accord, right? That means that the family was in one accord. They were all unified. They were all together one accord in prayer and supplication that means requesting and thanksgiving because prayer is kind of encompassing a lot of different components right but we know supplication is requesting prayer can be praise it can be um, asking it can be lots of thanksgiving so they were all praying together you know 120 people and they don't <laughs> name 120 people not a lot of people especially given what they were facing. And, and I think it's marvelous. You don't hear them say that they were fearful. You don't hear them say that they were confused. You hear of a group of people who are praying and begging with God and that they are doing this together. One accord. And, one accord. And I love the fact that family is involved. Christ's family is involved as well. <clears throat> Got a comment here. Um, one of our regular listeners, Jim, thank you, says they were one accord. No drama mm. or self-centered recognition. Truly loving each other is, is what brought the day of Pentecost. It's interesting. I'd like to add to that Ephesians 4, 13. Paul's talking uh, about the equipping of the saints, and he says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So these folks, 120 of one accord, they've come to a unity of the faith, mm -hmm. but they're also reaching out with all their might to measure up to full stature men and women in Christ Jesus. Yeah. This is what we're striving for. And as we come to that, the, the unity naturally comes together. It does. There's a book called Acts of Apostles that kind of looks at this book. And I love this short quote. It says, daily, and I'm assuming this took place not just in the time frame we're looking at in verses 12 to 14, but this is something that the early Christian church did a lot. But it says, daily they prayed for fresh supplies of grace that they may reach higher and still higher toward perfection under the Holy Spirit working, even the weakest by exercising faith in God, learn to improve their entrusted power to become sanctified, refined, and ennobled. These were people who not only wanted God's gift of the Spirit, but they were seeking it together, and they wanted what was best for each other. 
and they did it daily. Um, and, and I think the overriding power, my father-in-law has pointed out, uh, it's love. Yeah. Yes. If, if we're, Grace, if, mercy. yes. Because you know they weren't all perfect. You don't have 120 people in one room no. and then be perfect. <laughs> no. But if it's that love, because it's that love, it means grace was extended, mercy was extended, uh, understanding, support. To each other. Yes. And forgiveness. Yes. Non-condemnation, non-judging. Yes. Like, oh, he did this or she did that or he looks this way or how dare she say that. None of that. No drama. I love it. No drama. Well, <laughs> and there's a line that I didn't read in this book also. And it simply says, daily they prayed for fresh supplies of grace. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in that kind of grace and that kind of love is what I believe put them in the position to have this happen. Joy, would you read? We're going to jump over into Acts 2. If you'd seen some of our promotion, we said we're going to sneak a peek into the next book. Joy, would you read Acts 2, 1 through 4? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were, they were all with one accord in we, one place. There we go again. Yep, again. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each other. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. Okay, this is where. Yeah, we stopped mm -hmm. there. I've got a question for you. We, we have all read these verses. And we have all wanted this in our lives. We have wanted this in our families. We've wanted this in our church families. Can this truly happen again today? Will it happen again today? Why doesn't it happen today? A lot of questions there. But, I, but I we hear, we hear this. Kinda... We hear this <laughs> and we read this and we go, wow, that's amazing. I think. But I've never seen it in my life. Yeah, I would agree. Wait, I would... be careful. Not, not, to, not like this. You're be right, careful. Tim. Okay, why, why should I be careful, Tim? This is important. <laughs> Could you write? The Holy Spirit is striving with all of us yes. okay. to Good. attain to that perfection of character. And, and the more that we surrender to him, mm -hmm. the more he can do in, a, in each of us. Mm -hmm. So it is taking place. We like to use the word sanctification, and it, that it takes the, uh, a lifetime for it to work. Uh, but he is working, and he who began that good work has promised to carry it forward to completion. And there's so much hope in that verse alone, because one, it says, when I walk with you, Christ, you will carry this to completion. Amen. It's you who dwells in me. It's not I who loves, but Christ who lives in me, right? It's Christ who lives in me. There's no way that I can do it in self. Even the fact that, you know, we, we, we struggle with the word perfection or, you know, the truth is, is that there's, there's none that's capable of this except for Christ lived in us. Amen. Yeah. And we each have access to that Amen. every minute of every day. Yes. So, Tim, what you're reminding us is, and I asked the question from the standpoint of how come this doesn't happen in a large setting? How mm -hmm. come this doesn't happen in large, dramatic ways? And you're saying, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit moves quietly, the Holy Spirit moves individually in many different ways. And again, out of this devotional book on this, um, the book of Acts, uh, this author says, the promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or to any race. Christ declared that the, that the divine influence of his spirit was to be with his followers until the end. From the day of Pentecost to the present time, 2021, the Comforter has been sent to all who have yielded themselves fully to the Lord and to his service. So this quote would suggest that how does this happen in my life? How does this happen in, in my family, in my church family? Um, it's a daily yielding. It's a daily surrendering of my heart and fully yielding myself to Christ. And, and the result doesn't have to necessarily be big and bombastic. God and his spirit can move quietly in my life too. Amen. He, he does. He, 
right here it says it was a mighty rushing wind, right? So it can be both. Yes. You know, it, it, it you know, the Holy Father has the power to, to come upon us in any way. But I think one big aspect here is that we walk by faith not by sight, not by I mess up again or this is what I expect. Here, you know, they were expecting to see something and he's saying, no, no, I need you to walk by faith. And the only way for me to walk by that faith is to, you know, and to surrender and to say not my will but your will is to, as I, as I surrender daily, is to have that relationship with Christ, is to know him more. When I read his scripture and I know things like, he promises to finish a good work in me. That means I know him a little bit better and I can give, I have to, I can walk in faith, which means I give him the benefit of the doubt that he's gonna keep his word, right? And if I have that benefit of the doubt, it's because I have a relationship with him. I can continue to uh, walk more and more in faith and not by sight. Over and over again, it's walking by faith and not by sight. Even when I'm, even when I'm communing with other Christian believers, it might look, I, in my mind, it might look like you're going this way or doing something that might be something I would consider not Christ-like. But by faith, I would have the same, same, say, okay, okay, God, that doesn't look good. That might not be what I think that Tim or Brian should be doing, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to walk by faith that you're leading them, you're guiding them, and trust, right, and trust that the Holy Spirit is working in them like he's working in me. And when I trust that he's working in them like he's working in me, that's when that unity comes in, into place. In. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna, we're about done for the, this evening. What would be your challenge? What would be your word of encouragement perhaps to someone who says, I've read about the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I I would want him in my life. I, I would want to accept the same commission and challenge that the disciples were given, the early Christian church were given in Acts 1, 7, and 8. Um, but it just doesn't have seemed to have happened in my life. What, what would be your word of encouragement to someone who says, I, I want the Spirit, I want God's Spirit in my life. I want this kind of transformation that this early Christian church saw. It doesn't matter how old you are, what backgrounds you came from, what race you came from, what kind of work you do. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you want it, all you've got to do is ask for it. Mm -hmm. Jesus is waiting with longing desire to give his Holy Spirit to us. We've just got to ask for it. It's that simple. That is the only uh, requirement. Ask. Ask. Mm -hmm. And it will be given to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A quick quote, and then I'm going to hand it over to Joy, a quick quote out of this book again. It said, The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him than parents are to give good gifts to their children. God is, God is ready, Amen. God is willing, he wants, and, and we just have to ask. Mm -hmm. Joy, if a friend came to you and said, I want the Holy Spirit in my life, I want, I want not only the transformation that would come in my life, but I want the kind of power that would enable me to, to make a difference for God in my world. How, what would you encourage a friend who wanted that? Oh, um, the first thing I would do is say, let's pray. <laughs> I would be elated. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, first of all, it, um, it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable enough to say, you know, that what I've been doing is not working. It's not bringing peace. It's not bringing, it's not bringing uh, hope or joy in my life. So this other thing, this, this Holy Spirit, this relationship with Christ, you know, this gives it, it renews the mind, it renews the strength, it is ever, ever, never ending. When they, when somebody actually is vulnerable enough to say that they want that, Christ says he gives it and he gives it abundantly and immediately and without reproach. Amen. Yep. I mean, again and again, he tells us that without reproach, he gives it to us immediately. It's an immediate response. Can I, uh, 
steal our thunder from next week? Please do. That, um, we'll hand it back to Rick, and we would have already taken all the power out of it. <laughs> but in the same chapter, verse 37 and 38. Are you in 2? And you're in Acts 2. And I'm in Acts 2. Okay. And, the, and the answer is here. What are you going to tell that person that's asking? And, and Because this is exactly what happened. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And here's the good news. For the promise is to you and to your children Amen. and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And he's calling everybody. That's right. It's, it's an equal opportunity gift. Amen. It was not something that was just handed out to 120 people um, shortly after Christ returned to earth. It's something that's available to us. And uh, Thelma, who's in our audience tonight, um, just reminded us again of that wonderful text, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that includes the ability to have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So we would just encourage you, as, as Tim has said, it's simple as asking. It's as simple as, as saying, God, I want the infilling of your spirit in my life. And it's a daily thing. It's a daily dying to Christ. And so we would invite you to do that, to pick up the, the mantle, the commission that was given in Acts 1, 7, and 8, and to wait patiently for the infilling of the Holy Spirit because God wants to give it to you. Amen. So we're going to close tonight with prayer. We're going to invite you to join us next Wednesday night. We'll be in Acts 2. And uh, so let's pray tonight. And uh, again, if you have a prayer request you'd like to tag to Facebook comments, please do so. And we'll pray for that later on as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what an exciting time that must have been for those very early, early Christians who spent time with you, who grew closer to you. And although there were confusing moments because because they spent time praying and studying and they were unified together in love. Lord, something totally amazing happened. We just, Lord, we pray for each person watching right now that the Holy Spirit can be that real in their life also, that they would reach out and say, God, I need your spirit in my life. I want that kind of power that will not only transform my life, but transform the lives of those around us. In that name, amen. Amen. Folks, thanks for joining us tonight, and uh, please join us next week, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Thanks for joining us.